Take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. In Romans 1 to 3, we have heard the massive declaration of the universal guilt of man. Paul has announced God's inescapable condemnation and wrath. We all stand without excuse before a patient and sovereign and holy God. We are all without excuse for through everything he has made and everyone he has made, God has revealed himself. And what we have learned through all of this is that none, not one, and not all of our works by any system of law, whether it's conscience or culture or the Old Testament, will avail one little bit for our eternal salvation. What we have witnessed in recent years in the terrorist attacks on American soil and all around the world simply seems to underscore what the Bible has declared seems right to us to say, well, of course, those people are guilty before God. Look at what they do. But so are morally good people who are sacrificing their lives to try and reach and rescue in the rubble that's left. Hard for us. We look at A weary soldier or firefighter who has been on for 24 hours, who has seen unspeakable horrors. We don't think to ourselves, if this man or this woman is not justified before God, they will suffer the unending wrath of God. How can a so profoundly corrupt and justly condemned people have a right standing before God? Now, this problem involves two great questions, which are answered in this section of Romans. The first is, how could God remain just and yet pronounce sinners not guilty and righteous before him. Now, in modern terms, this gets couched in term, how is it fair, which has nothing to do with anything. We do not impose upon God some humanistic system of fairness. God is just. He is true to his character, and he is true to his covenants and commitments. He will do what he says. He will act entirely consistent with who he is. So, the question actually, instead of being dimmed, is actually amplified. Pardon the mixed metaphor. How can God remain just and yet pronounce sinners not guilty and righteous before him when he keeps his commitments to condemn Sinners, and when he acts entirely consistent with his holy, righteous, just character. How does he say, I accept you? And the second question then is, if this righteousness is actually available to us, how is it applied to us? How do we receive it? Paul is going to unpack that for us. These verses in Romans, picking up in in Romans 3, verse 21, we see the meaning of justification. To be right before God is at the heart 
of salvation. The doctrine of justification is just simply the answer given in the Bible to the terrible problem of sin. Sin separates us from God. Sin calls down upon our heads the righteous wrath and just condemnation from God. Now, sin has two important components. There's the moral component whereby we are corrupted. And there is the legal part, component, whereby we are condemned. Justification is primarily, not exclusively, the work of God that deals with the legal, condemning part of sin. That's why in Romans 1 to 3, the, the whole talk is about the different forms of law under which we are condemned. At the heart of what Paul is dealing with here is the confusion of these two components or two elements. When people try to be justified by good works, they are functioning in the moral arena and yet are still condemned in the legal area. It's like this. Doing good while sentenced to death will not excuse you from being condemned. You see it? As a condemned person under law, you can go out and save the little lady crossing the street from being hit by the car. That does nothing to alleviate your legal condemnation. And that's what all of the people were trying to do. Well, I obeyed my conscience. Well, I was consistent with my culture. Well, I kept the law. And Paul is saying... <laughs> Wrong solution for the problem. That's the moral area. Your problem is you have been condemned by some system of law that God has put into place so that you are without excuse. And that is why we must believe, we believe that the doctrine of justification must be continued to be upheld today against all forms of of religious teaching that attempts to do away with it, whether it comes from Catholicism or whether it comes from a new perspective on Paul. If you're not familiar with some of this theological, fine. We are going to uphold the biblical doctrine of having a right standing by God and before God with a righteousness imputed to our account that comes separate from us and apart from us and only through the obedience of Jesus Christ. They confuse the legal and the moral by insisting that justification is the infusion, the placing of a person a principle of righteousness and therefore they wrongly assert that we are accepted as not guilty based on moral acts of righteousness we produce as a result of having this infused righteousness. Now, as we will see in chapters 4 and 5, justification is a legal declaration of not guilty based upon God's righteousness imputed to our account. So we have a righteousness apart from us, separate from us, which is attributed to us. Moral transformation is the outworking of sanctification, that is, faith working through love. Now, let's take this up and watch Paul, listen to Paul, as he first declares there is a righteousness that is revealed now. Verse 21. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and prophets bear witness to it. But now, God's righteousness is manifested. Now, a redemptive historical development is implied by the opening. The now word is a time word. But now, something is different now. Tom Schreiner wrote, 
that this, quote, marks the shift from the old era of sin's domination to the new era of salvation, end quote. Fundamental to Paul. And the Bible's structure of salvation is this change, this change from the old that was then to the new that is now, the flesh to the spirit, from law to life. This is both in the larger picture of salvation history and in the personal application of our individual salvation. At both the historical, the meta picture, the big picture, and at the personal level, my salvation, Christ crucified is the central event and theme. Before Christ crucified is then. After Christ crucified and risen is now. So when does the now begin? Well, through this text and all of Paul's writing, the change takes place in both the death and resurrection of Christ. Since the cross, God's righteousness has been made visible apart from a system of law. The Old Testament scriptures witnessed to this event, that is the manifestation of God's righteousness at the cross, since keeping the law cannot bring us righteousness, and since the function of the law was to show us what sin is, then God's righteousness is now made visible, not through the law, but it is made visible through a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to know how good you have to be to get to heaven, look at Jesus. There it is. There it is. And so that's what he argues in verses 22 to 25. There is a righteousness that has been revealed now, and that righteousness is centered on Christ. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all who believe. There is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance, or possibly patience, he had passed over the former sins, the sins committed in the then. Huh? Now, I know there's much to be highlighted and explained in these few verses. They are some of the most theologically dense texts about our salvation in the New Testament. But what out stands out to me is the utter Christ-centeredness of this paragraph. Now, understanding how God justifies us involves statements of truth. To defend it against errors must, means we have to think carefully about it as well. But hear me well. Without Jesus Christ, we have no justification. Without Him as the center of the Father's delight and the Father's utter determination to glorify Himself in His Son, without His own righteousness and holiness as the reality of which the law and the prophets are a description, without His sacrificial death, standing before and suffering the eternal wrath of God for us, without His glorious resurrection and ascension and reception into heaven, certifying that the work was complete and accepted. Brothers and sisters, without Jesus Christ, we are doomed and damned. It is that simple. So I'm going to be fierce in my dedication in holding up my Redeemer and Ruler to be trusted, whose cross is the ground of my justification, and who himself publicly displayed the righteousness of God. But 
now a righteousness from God has been revealed. How? Through Christ, His cross, and His resurrection. And this righteousness comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Verses 22 through 23. Regardless of who we are, and what we are, corrupt and condemned, we can have a right standing before God through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul is unmistakable. Through faith in Christ by those who believe. Why is this so? Why no distinction? Why is it now, actually has always been, through faith and belief? Because everyone has fallen short of God's glory. Now, that is a little bit of a surprise. Because if theologians wrote our Bible, they would say everyone has fallen short of the holiness of God. Sin is in essence a sin is a violation of God's holiness. And it is that. But the stunning thing here is that Paul raises the bar. This is why no law-keeping will help you. Because it is not just His holiness you have fallen short of. It is His glory, His magnificence, His weightiness, His essential purity, His glory. Magnifying God is the ultimate standard. Now, some commentators want to place this glory as some form of God's image in which we were created. I am prepared to say that the essence of sin is self-esteem, pride, instead of God-esteem, praise, that we seek and serve self instead of seeking and serving God. That's what it means to fall short of His glory. All have sinned, and thus, or in this way, fail to magnify God with every thought and desire and deed. This is why Paul is going to say in chapter 4 that Abraham did not waver, but grew strong in faith, and in this way glorified God. The righteousness comes to us As a gift by His grace. It comes through faith in Christ and it comes as a gift by His grace. Make no mistake. The sheer grace of God, He simply gives us a right standing before Him. He declares us not guilty and He places His own righteousness to our account. It is a gift. It is totally undeserved. It is totally graciously bestowed. And that righteousness is grounded in the cross of Jesus Christ, verses 24 through 25. So here is Paul's argument. There is a righteousness apart from the law. That righteousness is centered in Christ. It comes through faith in Christ. It is a gift by His grace. And it comes grounded in the cross of Christ. Two important terms are used to show us the cross. The cross is the grounds of righteousness of those who believe because at the cross are two important theological terms. I know our modern world and sometimes our modern Christianity wants to boot these terms. Nobody understands them. That's because nobody talks about them. That's because nobody teaches them. That's because nobody reads them in the Bible and says, this is what this means from the Bible. Not from my theological grid, from the Bible. And so the cross brings us a redemption and propitiation. These are important terms. will help us to see Jesus more clearly. First, redemption. This word is used to describe the worth and work of Christ whose life Paid for our freedom. This word comes from the slave market. To redeem was to buy back a possession. It was to go into the slave market and to pay a price, a redemption price. That's this word. 
It had multiple uses, but this is what Jesus has done for us. We are pictured in the Bible as slaves sold to sin. Jesus' death purchased his people and set them free to be his own possession. Don't you know you are bought with a price? You are not your own, but you are to glorify God in your life and your body. The Bible is full of the use of this words, and words like it point to what God has done. We have been purchased out of the slave market of sin. And the second word is one we are generally not familiar with. It is the word translated propitiation. Now, in spite of modern efforts that shy away from the cross as a satisfaction of God's wrath, this is what it means. And yes, it was done at the mercy seat and through Christ's suffering, the wrath of God for us. The wrath of God is not uncontrolled, wild, capricious anger. Rather, it is a settled purpose of punishment against all that is contrary to his nature and demeans his glory. Yet, in his love and mercy, God took the initiative to display Christ as the propitiation, the satisfaction of his just wrath. Jesus actually took on himself God's wrath. He suffered every bit of God's wrath for his people for all, all of their sin and sinfulness. As Isaiah wrote, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Do you by faith believe that God the Father is satisfied on your behalf with the Son's suffering? He has bought you and He has stood between you and the wrath of God and He has sheltered you not as a shield but as a bearer of his suffering. So here is a righteousness that is revealed now, a righteousness centered on Christ, and here is a righteousness vindicating God. Verses 25b through 26, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. Not us, because we don't think deeply. We don't even see this as a problem. Okay, move on. <laughs> Tell me I'm supposed to resume my business. That's what I'm really interested in. The problem of how God is just and justifier, eh, it doesn't bother me much. No, it's a witness to the shallowness of our thinking about our salvation. Paul thinks it's important. Paul thinks it's important enough to be a part of his delight in bringing the gospel to the people at the church in Rome. Well, so finally, a right standing before God is of little use if God is himself not just in all his actions, including the justifying the unjust. In one sense, the word righteousness here does not shift. It's all about being justified. The sinner is declared righteous by God on the grounds of the cross, and God is determined to be just through the cross. So under the old era, both historically and personally, God passed over, um, the word here, atoned, God passed over sins until Christ came. And until Jesus came and died on the cross, God saved people. But He did not save them on the grounds of their law-keeping, nor the sacrifices they brought. He passed over their sins until the Savior come, came. He had purposed to make Christ the center of all of His redemptive efforts so as to demonstrate to all, 
He's just in justifying the unjust who, whether dimly in the Old Testament or brightly in the New Testament, have faith in God's promises and his Redeemer. So God is righteous. He's just. He's acting in accordance with himself when he sets forth his Son as our righteousness and waits patiently for the day of the cross in redemptive history and applies the cross to us personally. He was just to pass over sins because he had purposed to punish them in Christ. So what happened to the sins of the Old Testament? What happened to David's sin and, and, and Jonathan's sin and Jeremiah's sin? What happened to those sins? Do they come and they bring their lamb and, and they lay their head and they confess and because they did this, that lamb is doing something for their sins? No. It is because by faith they believed God's command, they obeyed Him in a believing way, or they believed Him in obeying way, to be more biblically accurate, and they brought this lamb knowing somehow this lamb pointed to something and someone greater. How do they know that? Well, that's a story for another day. There was a day in which Abraham took his son, his only beloved son, it's the only time that phrase is used, and took him up and put him on an altar. And he raised the knife in obedience to God. And God substituted for a son a lamb, a ram. And Israel knows that rams are a substitute for son until the truly beloved son comes. So the cross vindicates God. Now what are the means of justification? Verses 27 through 31. Now, I'm aware I'm running long. Life is hard. I am not going to cut this short. So we have the meaning of justification. What is the means of justification? Paul highlights how justification is received and appropriated by answering three important questions or objections. Why is faith the way that the right standing before God is given? First, let me point out something. Faith is not the grounds of our justification. There is much confusion about faith. People often speak as though faith is the basis on which God saves us. They seem to say that God has salvation ready for us and when we exercise faith, when we believe, then God grants it to us. Any way of speaking like this has turned faith into something it is not. We are saved by faith not as because of faith. It is like saying properly, this order came via UPS. Faith is the via of salvation. For faith does not have merit with God. It is not that God has done it all, and we provide faith to complete the transaction. See, a lot of people, particularly evangelicals, talk as though we got this whole package and there's one little keyhole. And we have the faith and we put our faith in there and that completes it. It's like it's this cipher and there's this one little piece of the puzzle. God built the whole puzzle and left out one piece and gave it to us and we plug that piece in and voila, there it is. That is not the way the Bible talks. Faith does not have merit. It's not that faith is the final component in an incomplete work. It's not that faith that, uh, turns the metal of God's work into the gold of salvation. It's not some kind of alchemy. Faith is simply believing God's truth and promises. We believe now that Jesus' work on the cross and resurrection is all that we need. And those who believe have already borne from above. 
John speaks of this as well in 1 John 5, 1 to 5, where he writes, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Son, is the Christ, has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves those who have been born of Him. Paul speaks of faith as the gift of God's grace. Now, why has God done it this way? There are lots of answers. But the answers in verses 27 and 28 give us the main reason. God has done it by faith because faith excludes boasting. Verses 27 to 28. Paul says, What becomes of boasting? It's excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we hold that no one is justified by faith, that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. The word law here, you could substitute the word principle. It's a, it's a different use of this word. So what kind of, by a principle of works? No, but by a principle of faith. That would help us not to get all tangled up in, well, frankly, in a lot of theological debate on that sentence. Since we stand righteous before God by faith, we cannot boast in our works. When what we receive is a gift of trust, then the giver is the one who is praised. For Paul, anyway, framing our salvation through words that leaves man room to boast or to glory is utterly wrong. This is the God-centeredness of Paul. Boasting excluded because faith is the means and Jesus' work is is the grounds. Not our work, but Jesus' worth and work, believed and trusted. So the integrity of the good news of a right standing before God, apart from our working for it, is upheld. Second reason is that faith unifies Jew and Gentile. Verses 29 through 30. Here's the second question. So, is God then the God of the Jews only? Of course not. Is He not God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. You see, faith is the unifying factor. Since we stand righteous before God by faith, then Jew and Gentile, circumcised and uncircumcised, are one in faith. While the law separated the Jews from the Gentile, the faith in Christ that gives a right standing before God unifies Jew and Gentile. Why is this? Because God delights placing both Jew and Gentile on equal footing to show that He is one. Faith excludes boasting. Faith unifies Jew and Gentile. And, surprisingly, faith upholds law. Verse 31, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold it. Since we stand righteous before God by faith, then the just demand of the law are established and upheld and gloriously fulfilled, not by us, but by another. The allusion here to nullifying the law and fulfilling the law point back to Jesus. He did not come to set the law aside. He is its reality. And the fulfillment as he asserted in Matthew 5. The law described the righteousness of God and declared the sentence of death on its violators. And so while we cannot keep the law, we trust Jesus for our right standing before God. So what do we say? Well, first, the law has served its function, has been fulfilled. You cannot be saved by keeping the law. You cannot be saved by going back to the law. No law principle can give you life. No law principle can buy your soul. No law principle can pay the price. It simply describes, demands, and dooms. And one of your greatest needs is not self-fulfillment, not happiness, not contentment, not wealth. Your greatest need is righteousness 
from God. Do you have it? So the issue is a right standing before God. The problem is that we do not glorify God. The punishment is the wrath of God. The provision for it is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The principle is faith that believes and bows. And the purpose is to end boasting and glorify God. Will you believe and bow today? Father, thank you. It is not of us. It is not from us. It is not upon us. It does not depend on us. It is utterly, wholly, completely, totally Your work from beginning to end. And it is Christ in his death and resurrection. It is Christ in his act of obedience to you. In dying on the cross. It is that righteousness. Which saves us and is put to our account. That we might stand right before you. And we have that. By believing what you have said. Do that work of grace in unsaved hearts this morning and help us who have believed to grow, to know more, and to rejoice in you. And the more we know of you and know about you and know what you have done for us, may our boasting in you and our praise of you and our glorying in you ever, ever more increase. In Jesus' name.